Okay, picking up on chapter eight. I think this is, yeah, slide 11, if you follow along in Canvas. Plain view, plain feel, plain touch. It's using your senses, five senses, not the sixth sense. I had a feeling, especially women's intuition. With women's intuition, it's scary. Okay, you guys, most of you guys are too damn young to understand. Well, Mr. Farr should know. But the rest of you are too young to know how scary women can be. Even you younger ladies don't know. The power you have. Who's laughing over there, Mr. Farr? The power you possess. And before we get started, I'll elaborate on that. I'm a licensed private investigator, have been since 2000, so going on 19 years. My practice focuses primarily on criminal cases, felonies. Specifically, I like to deal with homicide in capital, uh, capital cases. But because I advertise, without I get calls. Normally, it's from a female crying that she thinks her husband's cheating on her. Or boyfriend. I have had a couple of boyfriends. They want to pay me to surveil their significant other, give them proof that he's cheating. I explained to them that my rates are expensive. And instead of paying me, they should pay an attorney and file for divorce. And they'll say, well, why should I do that? I just want to know. I said, no, you don't. You do know. If you're willing to pay me, you already know what he's doing. And they'll usually break down crying. Well, I know, but I just need to know for sure. I need those pictures. I said, no, you don't. I've never taken a single case, not one. It's like taking candy from a baby. I'm not going to take advantage of, a, of anyone in distress. Instead, I'll refer them to an attorney, and if they need guidance with the divorce process, I try to help. No charge. But I'm not going to surveil, peek through the windows, and take pictures of a cheating spouse. Okay? Women's intuition. It's not up here, but if you're in law enforcement, and you're a female, and you have a feeling that something's going on, you're probably right. And if I was your partner, I'm going to act on that. I'm not going to question you. I'm going to say, let's go. What do you think is going on? Females are canny. Some men possess that ability, and of course, some women don't. But as a rule, I'm going to listen to what the, my partner's got to say. So what the book's talking about is plain view, plain feel, plain touch, five senses. What do we, what do we got? What are the five senses? Anybody? Touch. Touch, taste, feel, hear, feel, hear, hear. hear. Smell. smell, smell. Of course, observations are always good. But the smell, I walk down the tiers and just come to a dead stop and then back up because I smell something. Sometimes it's dope, and there's a couple of times it's blood. Blood has a distinct odor. And when there's a lot of it in the cell, you can pick it up. Uh, Pruno, Pruno, inmate made wine, has a distinct odor. Okay, so you can pick it up. All your senses, plain feel, plain touch, what you can hear, what you can see. I'll caution you on the touch. We talked about Terry stops. When we do a Terry stop, remember we're doing this. We're touching, right? If you're going to go in because you believe there's a firearm or a weapon, maybe a knife, and you want to retrieve it, be very careful how you handle the contraband. I've seen officers cut themselves up pretty good. It's a trap. Uh, searching a car, searching a home, searching a cell. When you come up across a table, somewhere where you, even a vehicle, if you can't see underneath, you're gonna use a mirror. Have you seen that? Border checks, right? Mm -hmm. They use the mirror. That's for your own protection. But if you don't have one, this is the base of the table. You never run your hand like this. I don't want to do it here because I found gum and things underneath. <laughs> Part of this. So this is the table. Don't do this. Inmates and on the street, some suspects want to hurt cops. They will plant razor blades and sharp objects so that when you do this, you're going to slice your fingers. And they think it's funny. Be careful. The correct procedure 
This is the table, not this, it's this. Gently tap, just like that until you feel it. If you have a mirror, great, use the mirror. Get down on your hands and knees, look underneath. There's sometimes you can't do that. Uh, if you're outside, maybe the ground's too darn hot. You're not gonna get down on your hands and knees to look underneath. Uh, you can't, you don't have a mirror with you. So you're going to reach down there and touch. Inside finger wells, if we're going back to the street, another area, you touch. Even if you have gloves on. I've heard officers say, well, I was wearing gloves. While they're bleeding out. I was wearing gloves, Sarge. I was a sergeant at the time. Look, and put their hands dripping blood all over the place. <laughs> How'd that work for you? They forgot something simple. Tap down. Okay. All right, so that's your touch. That's In law enforcement, you're going to use that more than probably your other senses. Observation, touch. You hear someone cry for help. Help. You're walking down the street, maybe down a sidewalk in front of a bunch of stores. You hear someone cry for help. Help. You go to the door. It's locked. Help! What can you do? You're the officer. What are you going to do? Bust it down. Bust it down. Good. You're not going to go and say, well, wait a minute. I need to get a warrant. Doesn't make sense, right? No. Uh, that's warrantless entry. Someone's in distress. You can render aid. Uh, let's see what it says. Uh, back up here. Plain view allows uh, the warrantless seizure. Use of evidence of an object that is seen in plain view by the officers engaged in lawful activity. Emphasis on lawful activity, working within the purview of whether it's Terry or you got preponderance, you have uh, reasonable doubt, whatever your suspicion is, but it's founded and it falls under lawful. Because if it's unlawful, then you're going to be in trouble. Plain field touch. Officer who feels or touches something suspicious during the course of lawful activity can further investigate the matter. You suspect. Again, Terry's going to keep popping up, guys. You suspect. You conduct the pat down. You believe now that there is, in fact, a weapon, something that can cause you harm. You can investigate further. We talked about detaining someone and restraining someone, two different things. I believe this person's got a weapon, something that caused me harm. I go from detain to restrain. I'm going to put them in restraints, handcuffs. Finish my search. I'm taking precautions because I want to go home at the end of my shift. Okay, I encourage you to do the same. Officers use their senses on a daily basis, regardless of your agency. So no matter where it is you believe you're going to end up working, this still applies. Questions? Got a video for you. Police citizen contact. Video unavailable. You didn't say that in the office. Okay, so we'll skip the video. Uh, border checkpoints. We talked about lawful searches. We talked a little bit about checkpoints, whether DUI or border. Bless you. Bless you. Are border checkpoints a good idea? Yes. yes. Do they infringe on your rights to privacy, Fourth Amendment? No? Yes? Yes. 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 It gets kind of confusing, <coughs> yeah. It does. It is an infringement. But it's one the courts believe is for the safety of the mass, the communities. And they've made allowances. I was reading a border check. Okay, let's think this out. Border check. We're close to the border. We're at the border. We want to come from Mexico this way, to the United States. They stop your vehicle. Is that a lawful stop? Yes. They ask you to step out of the vehicle. Yeah. They search your vehicle. Yes. 
That's a border search. That's what it entails. But now what if that stop is 60 miles away from the border? So instead of being on the border, I don't know what 60 miles is from the border. Somebody help me. It's from Temecula. Temecula? That's what I was thinking. <clears throat> uh, let's say the top of the mountain, maybe, just before. As you go out of uh, Temecula on the 15th. Oh, beside that, 78, 90. Before that. At the top where the scales are. Because mm -hmm. there's a checkpoint there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, right. They call that Fallbrook right yeah, there. Okay. Yeah. That's about, let's say, 60 miles. They stop you, ask you to pull over, ask you to step out of your vehicle and start to search your vehicle. Is that still okay? Yes. Yes. Why? Because they have cameras all the way from back there to the border, so anything you're doing from there, they see at that border too, and they'll stop you there. Okay. They got cameras. Or suspicion, the way that you answer the questions at the border. So you think it's a follow-up from the most, border? Most but important. you came from Escondido. Or just because. You came from Escondido and just got caught up. You were never even near the border. Reasonable suspicion. Mm -hmm. Reasonable suspicion. Based on what? Um, you see like a minivan full of a bunch of people. Okay. Minivan. She said, <laughs> well, let's talk about these type of people. What do they look like? It's my uncle, man. <laughs> it's his uncle. Gio's uncle. Come on, you got to draw the picture. Of, they look like Mexican nationals. The tallest guy is five foot three. <laughs> right? They can barely see. They all wear these hats. We're stereotyping, okay, we're stereotyping. But, but that's what they do too. That's what Border Patrol does too. They're not gonna stop everyone. It's it just, so much. you just can't do it. You could never get it done in a day. The traffic would be all the way back to the border. But the court said that there is not only reasonable suspicion, but probable cause to substantiate that search based on searches they've done in the past in that area and the amount of people they detained that were illegally in this country and trafficking narcotics. So it's kind of a self-justification, uh, that circle. Well, I can arrest you because I know you have drugs. Well, how do you know he has drugs? Because I arrested him. You see the logic, it's circular. Mm -hmm. But the court went for it. They said, okay, we can do that. Now it's substantial, up to even 60 miles away. They could still do these border searches. Is it fair? What do we think? Is it fair? Does anybody not think it's fair? Really? Everybody agrees it's okay? Yeah. I don't care for it, but yeah, I do think. For my own safety, the safety of others, heck yeah, I want you to stop everybody. I want you to take extra precautions. And that's kind of the way the court sees it. Think of the balancing act again. The table, individual rights, safety of others. Yes, sir. Doesn't that fall under the, the umbrella of uh, national security? Homeland, yeah. National, yeah. But individuals, you could still challenge it. And they have. In litigation, Supreme Court's ruled on it, and they said, nope. They're justified for the good of humanity, I think they said. Okay, so search is conducted with a warrant. I have a warrant to go into your vehicle, your home. Your office, your plane, whatever. But I have the vehicle. I have the warrant. Based on probable cause. The warrant is based on probable cause, not reasonable suspicion, a hunch, or intuition. It's supported by an affidavit, written statement, set of facts, establishing we, why we should go in and conduct the search. We already went over this. Yeah, we did. Oh. We're going to continue to. No, no, because I have them in my notes. So. Yeah. This is, yeah. You're going to hear this again and again and again. Yeah, we did. And we're going to go over it again. And there's always a reason for that. Quizzes come back and you're still missing these questions. So here we go again. Terry, stop. We know that one, right? We know reasonable suspicion. We know probable cause. Except when the quiz populates. It's like, oh boy, I've never seen this before. Okay. <laughs> Officer prepared. And here's a question that was missed. Order based upon, issued by a judge. The question was, who can authorize the warrant? The judge, magistrate, another officer, and it goes on and on. What's the correct answer? The judge. And that's what people put down, and it's wrong. 
It sounds like it, but it's not. This is the correct answer. A judge, a detached judge or magistrate. Okay, you know, well, that's so it. No connection. With that. No connection. That's why they got to be detached. <clears throat> this says issued by a judge. It's detached judge or magistrate. They have no interest in the matter whatsoever. Can authorize the warrant. Okay. That was the one that gave you guys trouble. So what may be seized? Specified in the warrant. What's that called? Let's see if it's up there. No, the word's not up there. But what can be seized is in the warrant. What is that called? Is that part of the warrant? It's a, it's a clause. Something clause. Where we're going over here. Particularity. Particularity clause that tells you, the officer, what you can confiscate. Where you can search. What time you can search. How long you can search. It's called particularity. Contraband, anything illegal to import, export, produce, or possess. That's just a generic definition for contraband. And then, of course, the exclusionary rule. What is the exclusionary rule? What are the provisions? This is another biggie. Jackie, what is it? Um, it? I know you did. <laughs> exclusionary rule. What is it? Any evidence seized, right? Any evidence seized. What do you got, Carol? I was going to say, uh, yeah, any evidence seized that's uh, illegally obtained. Okay, now we're making a roll. Illegally obtained evidence. What is that called besides exclusionary rule? There's some terms in there that you should be familiar with. Fruit of the poisonous tree. There you go. Fruit of the poisonous tree. It's part of the exclusionary rule. And I think I have a video, hopefully I plugged it in, that's going to talk about this a little bit more. I have my warrant. It tells me when, where, how, and what I could be searching for. It's duly sworn. I go to execute the warrant, as stated, between the hours of, say, 9 in the morning to 6 at night. So it's 1 in the afternoon. Here's my warrant, ma'am. I'm here to search. I believe you're in possession of stolen big screen TVs. I start my search. But instead of just opening doors and looking where someone could conceal a big screen, let's say 65 inch, flat screen TV, I go to the kitchen and I start opening drawers. What's happened? I'm the officer, I, instead of just looking for the big screen TVs, I start looking in kitchen drawers. Can I do that? No. No. I was going to say, you violated the terms of the warrant, so that, that would fall under the exclusionary rule. Absolutely. I violated the terms of the warrant. I have no business going through somebody's kitchen drawers, looking in the freezer, refrigerator. I'm looking for big screen TVs. That's the way the warrant was written up. I never said I was looking for money or drugs. So, exclusionary rule. I go in with my warrant to find these big screen TVs. But I go off into the kitchen and I open a drawer and lo and behold, a big brick of marijuana. I say, you're busted. Yeah. And I charge him for possession of marijuana with intent to distribute. We get to court, the attorney's going to say, no, your honor, exclusionary rule, fruit of the poisonous tree, he had no business being in that drawer. The warrant specified, and they're going to look at the particularity, big screen TVs. There's no way that officer believed he or she was going to find a big screen TV in a kitchen drawer. Um, would the officer get penalized for that? Like, uh, oh yeah, like what would <laughs> that happen? comes later. That just depends. Unions get involved, and yeah, but it doesn't just go away magically. They're held accountable. So you get the idea. Uh, inevitable discovery. What is that? Anybody ever heard of that term? Inevitable discovery. There's another case. Uh, it was a murder of a young child, 
female. They believed they had the suspect in custody. They were very certain about it. They already had arrested him, Mirandized him, and they were transporting him down to the county jail. Two officers knowing that they could not ask questions directly to the inmate, or the inmate, the suspect, start laying on the guilt trip. That wouldn't it be nice if the family could at least have their child back so they could bury him, give, him, give her a decent burial? That's the right thing to do. If I had, and they started laying on this guilt trip. So the suspect, feeling guilty, tells the officers where they could find the body. So let's say they told the officers, you're going to find the body at the corner of Smith and Elm. In that general area, we already had search parties out. And they were convening towards Smith and Elm. It was just a matter of time before they would have discovered that body anyway. So what the court said, if the body or the contraband, whatever it may have been, would have inevitably been discovered it does not violate their constitutional right. It's an interesting case. Falls in the purview of the exclusionary rule. Okay, search is conducted without a warrant. Okay, we can have a warrant and we can do a search. But what about if we don't have a warrant and we still want to search? These are some of the circumstances that allow that. Consent. That's the best one. You'll see that in traffic stops. Officer pulls you over. I clocked you doing 70 in a 45. What's your hurry? So you can have a little conversation. The officers believe there's something more going on. So do you mind if I search your vehicle? And you say, sure, go ahead. Consent. Anything they find can be used against you. Now, the thing with consent, it can be given, it can be withdrawn. So you tell the officer, yeah, go ahead, search it. I don't care. I got nothing to hide. About a minute goes by, and you think, oh, I do have something to hide. I don't want them in the vehicle. Officer, I would, well, get out of my vehicle. You're never going to hear somebody say, I withdraw my consent. Okay, they're just going to say, nope, 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 I take that back. Please stop. Stop what you're doing. There's no doubt the citizen asked the officer to stop the search. They must immediately stop. But anything they discovered between the consent was given and later withdrawn, they can use against you. But once consent's withdrawn, they can no longer continue the search unless they've already made a discovery of what they were looking for. So consent, there'll be questions about that one. Can be given, can be withdrawn. Exigent circumstance, something outside the ordinary to conduct a search. Terry falls in there. <coughs> Exigent, based on my knowledge, my suspicions, my observations, there's a lot of mitigating factors that come into play. I can search you. <coughs> search your home. Search is incidental to a lawful arrest. You're under, the, under arrest for breaking and entering. You're under arrest, boom. I handcuff you. Maybe I Mirandized you, maybe I didn't. But I can search you now. Okay, once I take you into custody, we can search you. We can go into your pockets, take your shoes off. A nice, thorough, clothed body search. Unclothed comes later when you get down to booking. Automobile exception and no reasonable expectation of privacy. Automobile law is changing almost daily. Uh, you can search within plain view, arm span. Does that sound familiar, the arm span rule? I'm looking to see for recognition. We understand that. Arm span. Myra, have you heard that? Yeah. Tyler, arm span. Anything within reach. So if you're in the vehicle and I ask you to get out because I'm going to arrest you, I could search anything within your control, within your reach. That little, I don't know what they call it, glove box here on the side? Maybe under your seat, definitely on the passenger side. But if it's something outside of your reach, I can't search that area. Okay, I can only search you. And no reasonable expectation of privacy during the search. And believe me, you won't have any privacy 
when you get to booking because you will be totally disrobed and it is an unclothed body cavity search. Has anybody witnessed that or participated in that? They're fun. Okay, they're fun. You really get to know somebody. I can just tell you, you really get to know somebody when you give them an unclothed body search. Okay, it's the middle of the night. You hear heavy knocks on your door. You look out. The police officers, you guys remember this one. I'm not going to waste more time because we did talk about this one pretty good. Okay, lawful arrest, the taking of a person into custody. By the actual restraint, submission of custody, officer here, she might be held to answer. Uh, an arrest. A person is not free to leave. Okay, we know that. They're not free to leave. It has to be conducted by a duly sworn peace officer. Okay, there's four elements. Let's go to those. An intent by an officer to make an arrest. I am going to arrest you for, you tell them what they're under arrest for. You have to have the authority. That's what I just alluded to. Sworn, duly appointed peace officer within your jurisdiction. It's a seizure or restraint of a person. And understanding by the person, he or she is being under arrest. Do you understand? You are under arrest. Uh, I've never encountered someone who hasn't, but you might. What about a citizen? I was hoping nobody would come up with that because that's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. It's just going to get you in trouble. So don't do it. You have no authority. You have none. To the contrary, if you try to initiate one and you're wrong, you could be charged. Yeah, they have good Samaritan laws. They got a lot of other provisions, but it's just not worth the hassle. Okay, leave it to the cops. Observe. Observe. <clears throat> document what you saw. Be a good witness. But please don't try to arrest anyone. Okay, any other questions on the arrest? I hope this one works. Yeah. This is the Miranda. We talked about it, but I want to make sure you get it. The department was forced to drop the charges because you forgot to read him his Miranda rights. What possible reason is there for not doing the only thing you have to do when arresting someone? I did read him his right. I did a version of that. Do you even know the Miranda rights? Yes. What's your mind? <laughs> we, we, you got a lot of stuff to do. You, go ahead. Go ahead. you going anywhere, Schmidt? You okay. got time? I had a thing where I could probably push it back. Go ahead. It's four declamatory sentences followed by a question for a total of 57 words. Okay. Uh, it's, it like obviously starts with you have the right to remain silent. I know you heard me before. And, and then um, <laughs> it, it, I think it sounds something like, uh, well, the thing, uh, you know, right, you have the right to remain an attorney. Did you say that you have the right to be an attorney? You do have the right to be an attorney if you want to. Where were you? <clears throat> I was uh, I was chasing my fur, sir. And how did that go for you? He, honestly, he did get away, and he threw me down pretty hard. I actually fucked up my elbow pretty bad. You see that? Yeah, actually, it hurts because the dirt gets mushed oh. into it. Ow! Ow! Wow! <laughs> okay. Is that how you Mirandize someone? <laughs> well, you, you kind of have a right to uh, have, be an attorney. <laughs> it's comical, they make fun of it. There's different uh, versions of the Miranda. It's based on Miranda versus Arizona. I think it's Ernesto Miranda. And I have another little video coming up after this that will explain further how Miranda came to be. Then we'll talk about the provisions. How you doing? Welcome to Hit Pew's History. We're about to kick it Miranda versus Arizona style, 1966, a Warren Court case, a huge Supreme Court case that if you're in a U.S. history course, guys, it's going to be on the test. And if you're not, it's going to be on the test of life because you really should know it. So why don't you sit back and relax? Let's see if we can't grow your brain ten times its size. Miranda versus Arizona. All right, so let's start off with the facts of the case. This is a case that occurs in Phoenix, Arizona, 
Um, an 18-year-old girl is kidnapped and she is raped, and she gives a pretty good description to the police. It's actually her brother who recognizes the car in the description, who belongs to Ernesto Miranda, who matches the description of the assailant, um, and the police arrest him. They put him into a lineup, he's identified, and they begin to interrogate him for two hours. And at the end of the two hours, eventually he breaks down, he admits that he is the guy who did it. And then this is really important, they make him give a written confession. So then he takes everything he's told them and he puts it down on paper and he signs it with kind of an oath that he uh, understands his rights, he understands that anything he's saying is going to be used against him, um, and he's been made aware of these rights and he's kind of signed that away post-confession. So uh, Alvin Moore, his defense attorney, um, after the conviction, because the guy goes down like a clown, gets 20 to 30 years, um, is going to appeal on the concept of the Fifth and Sixth Amendment, that the Fifth Amendment um, protects you from being a witness against yourself, your right to remain silent, and the Sixth Amendment guarantees you the right to an attorney. Um, so basically what he's going to say is that Ernesto didn't understand these rights, he was never told of these rights, so therefore he deserves a new trial. So um, it goes through the appeals process and the state, um, he's going to lose, but now we're in the Supreme Court and uh, we're about to go on a 5-4 decision. So let's go. So it's Earl Warren who makes the decision. It's a 5-4 decision. It's a very close Supreme Court case. Um, and Earl Warren was appointed by a Republican. He was a conservative, Republican of California, who was also a state prosecutor um, and governor of California. So this is a guy with a lot of experience in kind of law and order. Um, and at the end of the day, these are the arguments. The argument from Miranda is that first you have to look, bring in the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment basically gives the federal government and the Supreme Court the power to selectively incorporate the lower Bill of Rights. The language of the 14th Amendment is no state shall deny its citizens life, liberty, or property without due process. So it's that claim of due process denial um, and specifically the Fifth Amendment right of uh, self-incrimination, the Sixth Amendment right to an attorney that is at the heart of this matter. Did the police, by not you know, informing Miranda his rights, violate his rights? Because nowhere, this is really important to say, nowhere in the Constitution does it say you need to be informed of those rights. I think it's important to understand the zeitgeist of the time. And the zeitgeist of the time is this is the wild 60s, and that there is kind of a critical eye on the police and on interrogation methods. We just had the court case Escobedo versus Illinois a few years earlier, which says that once you request a lawyer, you have to be given that lawyer because the police were playing games after people requested lawyers. And it's Earl Warren that points out a few things. First, he points out um, police manuals that give you know specific instructions for kind of interrogating people and kind of how to use trickery to get them to confess. The second thing he points out too is that the FBI is already doing this, and so is the military. The military informs you of your right to remain silent, and so does the FBI. They even go as far as telling you that you can have a lawyer if you can't afford one. So it's these reasons that he believes the spirit of the Constitution is being violated. The effect of this decision is, in a sense, it's like a law. It's going to make the police all across the country have to read these specific rights to suspects upon arrest. And that's going to make their job definitely harder to do. At the end of the day, Miranda's conviction is overturned. Um, but don't jump out of your seat because we, you know, he's guilty. He's going to go back to trial. And he's going to be tried this time without the confession. It's not like these guys go free and if you can't, you can try him again. It's not a double jeopardy situation. So at that trial, he was convicted. Um, he ends up getting another 20 to 30 years. He was actually paroled in 1972. He ended up um, kind of making a business for himself, signing the back of the Miranda cards, the warnings that they have to read you. So he kind of became a local celebrity who was stabbed to death in 1976 in a bar fight. This is probably not an angel. <laughs> So the other side is the strict constitutional side. I just described what an activist court is. So the person who's a strict constitutionalist would say, that's not in the Constitution. Look, if you want to do that, if you want to make the police read people their rights that they should already know, then you should pass a law. And that happens through state legislatures, or you know, if it wants to happen through Congress, that's another story. But not through judicial activism, doing something the constitutionally never intended to do. Um, and now all you're doing, and this is kind of the words of the dissent, is you're making it easier for criminals to get off. That's kind of the major bulk of this argument. All right, there's been a couple of adjustments to Miranda, so let's look at a couple of the more modern Supreme Court cases that flesh that out, and then you'll have the right to remain silent. Anything you say, Kevin, will be used to get the court law if you didn't know.
exceptions really quick. One of them would be the public safety exception, 1984 in New York versus Quarles, where basically if there's a public safety emergency, you're running out of a building that's laced with dynamite and you have TNT all over your hands and the cops go, what are you doing? And you go, I'm going to blow up the building. I just laced it with dynamite. We can use that against you. And if you take the stand and you give testimony as a defendant and you've already given a confession, that confession can be used to um, kind of uh, discredit the testimony you're giving at a court trial. So if you confess to something that you did and the confession was thrown out, don't take the stand. It's a terrible idea. But at the end of the day, even in 2000, Dickerson versus United States, the current Supreme Court is going to uphold Miranda by um, stating that even voluntary confessions have to be Mirandized or they can't be used against you. The argument would be that it's going against kind of tradition of American culture at this point. We're also used to Miranda. But again, the other side is it's not specific in the Constitution, and we should be literally interpreting it, not spiritually interpreting it. But why don't you tell me what you think? Is uh, Miranda a good idea or a bad idea? Are the police to be trusted, or are the suspects running free? Um, give me a phone, give me a tab, take you to history, WTH, I don't know what you're doing, click my face, it'll take you off to hip use history, where we have over 250 videos. Um, and if you haven't checked me out on the Twitters, I do the tweeters and the twerkins down there, at hip use, uh, so we can see you online with that. All right, guys, we'll see you next time. And remember, Miranda comes into play when someone's under arrest. You have to Mirandize when? There's a specific time. When you're going to ask them a question. If you don't intend to ask this person any question, but you've arrested them, you do not have to Mirandize them. It kicks in when you start the questioning. And in Miranda, it had to do with a confession. It was also a language barrier. So there's several issues. Miranda, you have the right to remain silent. And they're all based on constitutional provisions. Right to remain silent. If you give up the right to remain silent, anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. Some say can and may be used against you. Okay? But they're going to use it. So there's no may. It definitely will. You have the right to speak with an attorney and have the attorney present before we ask you any questions. If you so desire it but you cannot afford an attorney, one will be appointed to you at no cost. There's something else missing. It's probably on the next slide. Do you understand? Do, probably one of the most important things. Do you understand these rights as I've read them to you? as I've advised you of them, whatever the agency asks you to read. What else? Do you understand they have to, they have <coughs> the acknowledgement? Right? What's that? They have to acknowledge that they're doing Absolutely. They must acknowledge. They could just shake their head either way, but you'll document on your form. They acknowledge they understood their rights by shaking their head, indicating they understood, but refuse to speak to them. That's usually what they're going to do if they don't want to say anything. Having these rights in mind, do you wish to make a statement? Do you wish to speak to me now? And that's usually the last thing you say. Um, I don't know if I put a form in this PowerPoint. I don't think I did. But 